So today, we, today we're going to continue in the series that we've started um, about what it means to be together as Christians, and particularly we're looking at this morning, very appropriately, of course, being Pentecost Sunday, the role of the Holy Spirit in our gatherings. Now, Paul's very clear, clear aim in this section of his letter is that there is no misunderstanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. So let me read, first of all, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we are in verse 1. It says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of all of them. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, to someone else. The one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and to another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still, Another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all of these gifts. He alone decides which gifts each person should have. I think my app has died, by the way, so you can just, you have to, yeah, it lasts all of, all of one uh, all of about five minutes, didn't it? Now, many people, know, many people know a certain amount about God the Father and about Jesus the Son, and, but, but actually there, there's probably a great deal of ignorance when it comes to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is, can sometimes be referred to as the Holy Ghost, but of course, He is not a ghost. He is a person. Perhaps it explains why maybe traditionally some people have tended to shy away from him. And I certainly was one of those people. When I was 10 years old, I prayed a simple prayer to Jesus and I asked him to come into my life and to forgive my sins. Did my life radically change in that moment? Well, not really. I had been brought up in a Christian home. I, I, I certainly loved my parents. Yet, and even at that very young age, I knew I needed Jesus. So I invited Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And in that moment, I knew, I knew God's presence. I, I knew an assurance of His love and, and, and just the certainty that I would, I would go to heaven. And I'd say my teenage years were a mark of God's grace and God's protection over my life. I learned the godly disciplines of prayer and, and Bible study, but it was at university that I discovered the power of God and more specifically the work of the Holy Spirit. And there was this, I guess, a slow awakening within me that, that God had, had something more. Now, I'm, I'm so thankful for the godly ministry of the church that I grew up in during those teenage years. The Bible was faithfully preached every single week. However, there was very little said about the work of the Holy Spirit except in the context of salvation. Now, it's very clear in Scripture that if anyone 
does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. So, listen, you cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. But I was also taught that the Holy Spirit had all the, the characteristics of a person. He thinks and he speaks, he leads, and, and he can be grieved. In John chapter 14 and verse 16, he is described as another counselor, as a comforter, as an encourager. And I knew a certain amount of theory, but I was also told that the gifts of the Spirit had stopped. In fact, that they just were not relevant for today. And it wasn't until I got to university that I heard this thing about being filled, about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I, I, spoke, to, I spoke to some friends about it, and I've got to admit, at first I thought some of them were just plain weird. Truth is, some of them were very weird, nothing to do with God or the Holy Spirit. Most of them actually, most of them weren't. So I did, I did what I had been told to do when I needed some questions answered. I turned to the Word of God. And I read these chapters that we're looking at today in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. And it was, it was probably the first time I think I'd ever, ever read them properly and I couldn't ignore what I read. See, the irony was I had been taught, I'd been brought up to believe that all of Scripture is the Word of God that's relevant for my life. Oh, by the way, except for those little bits about the gifts of the Spirit, you can ignore them, they're not really that relevant. But listen, you, you must not handle the Bible by picking out the bits that you like and ignoring the parts that you don't. All of Scripture is God-breathed. And as I read, I began to understand that I needed a fresh encounter with Him. And I began to pray for the baptism, for the filling of the Spirit. Now, some time went by until one evening, I'm praying with a friend in my room, and, and as he prayed for me, he asked God to pour out His Spirit. And I can remember that moment like it was yesterday, this skeptical, reformed Christian was unable to stand in the presence of God, and the experience was, was just so intense. I experienced the most dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit. Now, there have been moments since when His presence had been incredibly powerful, but on that occasion, it, it felt as if the room itself was, was shaking around me. The weight of God's presence just fell, and the, the joy of God increased. And for some time, we, we praised, and we sang, and we prayed. I received the gift of the ability to speak in an unknown language. And yes, a little weird at first. And there was this, this new direction, this new passion for Jesus. And as a result of my encounter with the Holy Spirit, I just felt something had changed. My prayer life was just more enjoyable. I had a greater desire to talk about my faith to my university friends. I guess a new boldness. And God's Spirit was at work in new power. And overnight, I turned from a Holy Spirit skeptic to someone who was empowered with the Spirit of God. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit is not a 21st or even 20th century phenomenon. For Jesus' disciples and for, with their Jewish background, the, the concept of receiving power and the Spirit coming upon people was no mystery. See, the work of the Spirit can be traced all the way back through the Bible right from the very beginning in Genesis, he was involved in the creation of this world. The disciples also knew about some of Israel's famous heroes, Gideon, Samson, David, Elijah, Elisha, whose lives were, were just dramatically transformed when the Holy Spirit came upon them. But in the Old Testament, when the Spirit came upon a person, he came for a specific purpose. And we see examples of that all the way through the Old Testament. He filled people for many different tasks. For example, the task of leadership. So we have a man called Gideon, where God calls him to lead his people. But Gideon is so conscious of his own weaknesses 
that he hides himself away and he asks, how could, how could I ever save Israel? Yet when the Spirit of God falls upon Gideon, he becomes one of the most remarkable leaders in the Old Testament. Or Elisha, who, who knew that, that if he was to continue Elijah's work, he must have the same spirit that rested upon his master. He understood that without a powerful anointing, it would be impossible. And the Holy Spirit is still in the business of transforming lives today. And so, so often God uses the weak and the, the insignificant and the inadequate people. And, but when the Holy Spirit fills them, they can achieve great things for God. And I hope you know that you are called by God to serve. And yet in a, in a very real sense, our service is not for God, but from God. To see this, we just need to look at the story and the life of Jesus. And, and Jesus did only what he saw his father do and heard him say. And like Jesus, we need to work from the father's presence that comes through the filling and, and through the overflow of the Holy Spirit. Listen to the words of John the Baptist. John had the privilege of preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. And John not only pointed to Christ as the Lamb of God who will take away our sins, but he also highlighted the glorious truth that although John baptized with water, Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And this is recorded in every gospel. It's even repeated in the opening chapter of Acts. And of course, it fulfills what had been promised in the Old Testament. See, the prophet Joel promised a new day that would break out in this world in world's history when God would pour out his spirit upon all flesh male and female young and old accompanied by supernatural manifestations such as prophecy and the seeing of visions and the dreaming of dreams so when when the shadow of the cross loomed large over Jesus and over his disciples, Jesus draws his disciples to himself in the upper room and he speaks to them in detail about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus gives a very strong statement in John chapter 7, verse 37, about the coming of the Spirit of God. He says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had, been, had, been, had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So for those present in that moment... This invitation to come to him and to drink was not yet available. They would have to wait. Later on, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And the, the anticipation is of the coming of the Spirit in this fresh, in this new way was, was just building bigger and bigger. However, Jesus must first be glorified. He must endure his own baptism. He must endure the cross, destroy death by the resurrection, and gloriously ascend to the right hand of God the Father before the Spirit would be given. And after Jesus ascended to heaven... He became the one who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. And just before his ascension, again he says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But still, they had to wait. Another 10 days they're praying. And then at last on the day of Pentecost, we read, suddenly the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It must have been slightly terrifying, let's be honest. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated 
and came to rest on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongue as the Spirit enabled them. And when the Holy Spirit came on those early disciples, they were, they were personally transformed. Frightened disciples were just unrecognizable. Reluctant witnesses hiding away in, an, in the upper room were, in the, were empowered. They were inspired. They were energized. They found themselves preaching. And as they preached, God was so clearly working with them that he confirmed their, sign, their, their words by signs. Many were saved and healed and then set free. Hebrews puts it like this in Hebrews 2, 4. He says, God also testifies to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And God was now working in partnership with his people. And it happened just as the Old Testament had promised. In fact, Peter, who spoke on that day, he said, this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And we live in the age of the Spirit where God's promise has been fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is here for everyone whose trust is in Jesus. And listen, that includes you, if you are a believer this morning. The outpouring of the Spirit deals with God's destiny for mankind. See, His purpose has always been to restore our relationship with God and this comes through the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross. So the starting point is always repentance and faith in Jesus. But the purpose of redemption is that we might become co-workers with Christ. In Acts chapter 2, we see that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is intrinsically linked to the baptism, to the filling of the Spirit of God. Now, I am aware that this little phrase, baptism of the Spirit, has caused much controversy and debate down through the years. But listen, there was no debate when he came and was given to that church 2,000 years ago. His baptism, his filling was absolutely essential to those disciples. In fact, Jesus warns them that they must not leave Jerusalem until they have received the Holy Spirit. But I also want you to note as well that this encounter is not a one-off experience. The disciples received another filling of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 4 and verse 30, and they were filled, and they were refilled, and they went on being filled by the Spirit. And, and this was the key to the disciples' success in following Jesus' commands to make disciples of all nations. And this, I think it should be obvious to us that this is the key for every believer, including you and including me today. We need to be living and we need to be moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me add to that. It's important that we hear and that we apply the whole gospel message to our lives. And this includes the baptism and the gifts of the Spirit. Because listen, God's plan has not changed for his church. Sinners still need to hear the word of God. And when they believe in Jesus Christ, they receive his Spirit. They are born again of the Spirit. But there should also be a baptism of the Spirit where there is this impartation of spiritual gifts and all the blessings that he brings. You see, Jesus is the spirit baptizer. The word baptism means to overwhelm, to immerse, or plunge. 
And this is what happens when you are baptized in the Spirit. You become overwhelmed by, you become immersed in and plunged into the Spirit of God. It's not just a splash. It's not like standing in a heavy shower of rain. It's similar to that feeling that you get when you go on holidays. Let me explain. I don't do sun very well. This northern Irish skin was made for clouds and rain. So, So when I go on holidays... At the very beginning of each day, I cover myself in factor 50 water-resistant sun cream. You can always spot me. I'm the guy sitting in the shade, covered in thick sun cream, looking a little bit more like a snowman than anything else. (laughs) But eventually, even I, sitting in that shade, get too hot. So I walk over to the edge of the pool and I jump in. And listen, there is no better feeling than going right under that cool water. It just feels so good to be enveloped, to be completely covered from head to toe in the water. And that is what it means to be baptized, to be filled with the Spirit. But we can get so caught up with the arguments about who speaks in tongues and who doesn't speak in tongues, or what is the role of prophecy in the church today. And listen, there are, of course, a place for all of those theological discussions on those issues, and we're going to come to those in the next few weeks. But what I want to say to you this morning is that you need to be saturated and to have this ongoing, refreshing encounter with the Holy Spirit. Don't be fearful of the Holy Spirit, or be too quick to condemn experiences or manifestations of the Spirit that you just don't understand, and in the process, ignore the promises of Scripture that the Holy Spirit is for you and for your children and for everyone who Jesus calls, Acts 2, verse 39. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 that there are two ways in which the internal work of the Spirit is manifest or shown in someone's life. The first, it is knowing Jesus as Lord. And the manifestation, the effect of this is this this supernatural love for Jesus and for his church. The second, Paul says, is through the receiving of spiritual gifts. Now, Paul is very clear about the reason the Holy Spirit gives for these manifestations in verse 7. He says, it's a spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. And the one sure way of knowing if what someone is speaking or what someone is doing is of the Spirit and therefore truly from God, they will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. Let me say it again. The Holy Spirit always points to Jesus as Lord of all. And the outcome of this is just supernatural love. When the Spirit comes on a person's life, it impacts the way in which you live. You will experience the love of God. Romans 5 verse 5, God's love has been poured into into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Ephesians 3, 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have the power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of God. But not only do we experience his love, we will also, you will also express your love for God. In Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius and his friends encountered the Holy Spirit, we read, they were heard praising God. And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and God's love invades your life, there will be this, this outward expression. Now, listen, all relationships involve emotions. And our relationship with God is no different. It will affect our emotions. And sometimes we hold back because of fear or because we're worried about what be embarrassing ourselves in public. But as God's Spirit comes on an individual, He will affect your emotions. And actually, others will notice 
Now, that is not to say that we are looking for emotionalism. Emotionalism does not change anybody. You see, we, we want an authentic move of God within our lives. And yes, I've been in those meetings where things feel more like hype rather than God. Not everything is a genuine touch from God. And we do need to be careful. We need to use discernment. But also, there can be those times when we just are too quick to dismiss things because they're outside of our comfort zone. And we can miss out on what God is doing and his blessings within our lives. When you come into the presence of God, you will experience a lasting change. Only God's Spirit can change your heart. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote, If your doctrine of the Holy Spirit does not include the idea of the Holy Spirit falling upon people, it is seriously and grievously defective. This, it seems to me, has been the, the trouble, especially during the present century, indeed almost for a hundred years. The whole notion of the Holy Spirit falling upon people has been discounted and discouraged. Surely one of the prime explanations of the present state of the Christian church. And when the Holy Spirit touches a person's life, there will always be an effect there will be some sort of tangible change. If you think back to that moment when you first became a Christian, Jesus called you and he changed you and the, the Holy Spirit filled you, you will, have, you will have felt his presence. And listen, for some people, that can also be the moment when you are baptized with the Spirit. However, for others, it can be a separate baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's probably been my story. But listen, it's not for me to question or to work out how and when God chooses to bless, but there should always be this continual pressing into, this pursuing after the Spirit of God. And this is the dichotomy, the, the mystery of Scripture. In that moment that you first believe you received everything you needed from God, His Spirit, forgiveness, and His salvation, and yet there is still so much more to experience as you seek after him. And, and although, although everyone's experience will be different, verse 6, as Paul saying that as well as me, there is always an impartation of God's love into your life as you encounter the Holy Spirit. The Spirit always points you to Jesus and assures you of his great love for you. And when the Holy Spirit is poured out, the face of God is revealed. And you can never, never be the same again. The second way in which Paul says the internal work of the Spirit is manifest or shown in someone's life is the presence of spiritual gifts. And Paul writes... There are different kinds of gifts, all given by the same Spirit, verse 4. And Paul goes on, on to identify some of them, wise advice, special knowledge, great faith, healings, miracles, prophecies, discernment, speaking in an unknown language and interpretation. Now, this list is not meant to be a complete list of all the gifts of God's grace to us. And as I've already said, I, I'm going to speak in these in a little bit more detail about the gifts of the Spirit when we, when we get into chapter 14. And in particular, the, those more controversial ones, both then and now, unknown languages, interpretations, and prophecy. But let me echo Paul's words here in verse 1. He says, regarding your question about the special abilities of the Spirit given us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. And it's so important that we talk about all of the gifts. And my point is this, that all of these gifts, the ones that we understand, and maybe the ones that we struggle with, are the work of the Spirit, verse 4, and that he gives them to each of us as he chooses and so each Christian has a gift to be used for the common good of the church, verse 7. 
we should be excited. We should be excited knowing that the Holy Spirit has given every one of us spiritual gifts. Now, I haven't got time to share any more examples of the Spirit power falling upon the early church in the New Testament, or even to go into any detail about church history. And I am conscious that there may be some people listening today who, like I had, have got some questions or are unsure about spiritual gifts. And listen, it's okay to have questions. You may however, have decided that maybe it's just easier just to dismiss the gifts of the Spirit rather than to accept them. And to you, to you, I would simply say this. I think Scripture is very clear that the supernatural work and the gifts of the Spirit are both biblical and for today. They have not stopped. Secondly, Keep listening, and, and keep listening with an open mind as we explore God's Word on these matters over the next few weeks. But I hope that today you will have seen that the work of the Holy Spirit is woven all the way through the Bible, Old and New Testament. The Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Trinity, and He does not conform to the natural order of this world. He is, in his very essence, supernatural. So he will not be curtailed by man, nor will he be bound by nature. He is God, and we are not. One story as I finish. Smith Wigglesworth was a plumber. And he was scared to speak in front of people. In fact, he preferred to serve in the background while his wife did most of the preaching. That was before he was baptized with the Holy Spirit. He writes, and I'm reading quotes from him. He says, for four days I wanted nothing but God. But after that I felt I should leave for my home. I went to the vicarage to say goodbye. I said to the vicar's wife, Mrs. Body. I'm going away, but I have not received the tongues yet. She replied, it's not the tongues you need, but the baptism. He protested, I have received the baptism, but I would like you to pray and lay hands on me before I leave. She lay hands on me and then had to go out of the room. The fire fell. He writes, it was a wonderful time. As I was there with God alone, he bathed me in power. I was conscious of the cleansing of the precious blood, and I cried out, clean, clean, clean. I was filled with joy and given a vision of, what, of, of which I saw the Lord Jesus Christ. I beheld the empty cross. I saw him exalted at the right hand of God the Father. I could speak no longer in English and began to praise him in another language as the Spirit of God gave me utterance. I knew then that although I had had many experience, I had experienced anointings previously, that now at last I had received the real baptism of the Holy Spirit as the disciples had received on the day of Pentecost. After Mrs. Body had prayed for him, Wigglesworth telegraphed his wife. The telegraph went on Tuesday, October 28, 1907, and it read, I have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit and spoken in tongues. The response from his wife was, I am just as much baptized in the Spirit as you are, and I don't speak in tongues. I have been preaching for 20 years, and you have sat beside me on the platform, but on Sunday you will preach for yourself, and I will see what there is in this. And although, although he was fully involved in the work, he used to struggle to, pub, to speak publicly and left all the preaching to her. The next Sunday, she sat on the bench at the back of church. And when it was time for the message, Smith walked to the platform. And as he did, God gave him the passage from Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And he was. And Smith preached fluently under a heavy anointing. And 
without breaking down or weeping as he had done on previous occasions. Smith himself said, suddenly I felt I had prophetic utterance which was flowing like a river by the power of the Holy Spirit. Polly, his wife, could not believe what she was hearing. She shuffled up and down the benches and said in a whisper, that's not my Smith, that's not my Smith. Amazing, amazing, what has happened to this man? He was indeed different. First the secretary to the mission and then his son George all wanted what he had and that meeting ended in holy laughter and many of the congregation rolling around on the floor. This was just the beginning and the years that follow saw their ministry grow and develop. This ordinary, spirit-filled plumber traveled widely across the world. The glory of God fell wherever he prayed and preached. Blind eyes were opened, deaf ears could hear, cancers were cured, wheelchair bound began to walk again, and people were even raised from the dead. But here's the thing. You need to know that you are equally as qualified to receive more of God's Spirit and to have a hunger and a passion for God. And listen, God will gift you as he chooses. And listen, although it is right to pursue the gifts of the Spirit, however more important than that is our need to pursue the giver, not the gifts. To seek after the face of God above everything else, to pursue him and him alone. Let's just stand together. I'm going to pray. Father, we, we want to thank you that you are the giver of good gifts. And Lord, we we humbly stand before you this morning, acknowledge our need of you, acknowledge, Lord, if we are to serve one another well, we need, we need the Holy Spirit. We need your strengthening. We need your love more than anything else in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us. I want to just pray now. I want to pray as you reach out to your Father in heaven. It's sometimes helpful if, you, if you're comfortable holding your, your hands out in an attitude of receiving. I want to pray for God's Spirit just to be poured out upon us. For God's joy to come. For the love of God to be poured into our hearts through His Spirit. Perhaps you've been praying for a gift or just seeking God for something in your life. Why not be expectant now as we gather as God's people together? God gives good things to his children. He's a wonderful father. And the greatest gift is the gift of his spirit in fresh power. So, Lord Jesus, we look to you as the Spirit baptizer, and we pray, Holy Spirit, come. Come and minister into our hearts, Lord. Lord, for those of us who are dry this morning, Lord, we need a fresh touch from you. Spirit of God, come. Lord, for those, Lord, that are, are struggling even with sickness and and in whatever form that comes in, Father, we need a touch from you, Lord. We need a healing touch from you. But Lord, we pray, Spirit baptizer, baptize us afresh this morning. Fill us afresh, Lord. Fill us afresh, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we need you.
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when the heart becomes free and the shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be Lord, we do thank you, Lord, that you, Lord Jesus, are the, the baptizer and the filler with your spirit. And Lord, we just say, Lord, we need you. Lord, we need you. So Holy Spirit, we pray, come. Come and move in my life fresh this morning. Why not begin to just speak out your prayer to him, to God, to Jesus? Listen, there's never anything to be nervous about in the presence of God. God is loving and gracious, and he pours out his love, and he pours out his gifts. As he chooses. He knows what's best for you already. He's not going to do something that's going to cause damage or difficulties to you. So just receive. Just be open to receive whatever God has for you today.
Sometimes when the Spirit comes and touches someone's life, it can be just, they just stand just completely still in His presence, just amazed. It can be very internal. Sometimes it can be much more external. Sometimes it can be a, that, a gift of a, a new language. Tell you what it always is. It's always praise and joy and the declaration that Jesus is Lord because that is the role of the Spirit. That's what He does. He reminds you of your salvation. He pours His love and He gives you His love for one another. So just receive. Receive from Him. I'm just going to sing that chorus again and then we're going to just draw things to a close but I want to encourage you if you want someone to stand with you and pray with you this morning we'd love to do that come to the front or you know or if you want to, um, us to come to you that's no problem at all there's going to be tea and coffee over in the other hall if, if you, you want to slip away and, and grab a drink but let's be open to what God is doing let's be open to the moving of his spirit in these days for the building of his church and for the proclamation of the gospel we need fresh impartation of the spirit do we not in our church we need a fresh impartation of gospel power to see men and women come to know him and listen God starts in us God starts in his church and then he takes us out there but to go out there, we need His power. Because we cannot do this in our own strength. I know that, and I know you know that. So we come and we say, Lord Jesus, Spirit baptizer, fill us. Fill us, Lord.